So, hello everyone. Excited to be here talking today on the Patreon of Zaragoza, which is La Virgen del Pilar. And I'm Alex Viñas. I'm a marketing manager and Cow Protocol. And today I'm going to talk to you about how does Cow Protocol reduce MEV by optimizing transactions through patch auctions. I've broken down the talk into four topics, which is the first one, MEV, the good, the bad and the ugly. Then what is Cow Protocol? Then the difference in the mindsets of maximization versus minimization. And lastly, where are we heading? So MEV, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Will Ethereum remain under this utopian dream of building decentralized finance for fairness for all the users? Or will the dystopian side take over? And as always, will the bigger fish eat the smaller fish? So first, let's try to define what is MEV. MEV was first coined as minor extractable value, but now has been recoined as maximal extractable value. And maximal extractable value is this hidden power that the block producers have. And what this hidden power allows them to do is the ability to arbitrarily include, exclude, or reorder any transaction in the block. Of course, this is a bit of a problem because right now, with the introduction of MEV Boost, we're incentivizing the block producers to only care about the maximization of the profits and not care about like the overall healthiness of the network. Before, block producers, no, miners, only had the source of revenue, which was gas fees, but with the introduction of MEV Geth and also the boom of DeFi Summer, then suddenly maximal extractable value became a thing and Ethereum kind of like turned in the wrong direction and starting hurting what makes Ethereum great, which was their users. But in reality, where does MEV come from? No? MEV comes from two ways, from either the execution layer and the application layer. In the execution layer, it comes from the fact that, as we just saw, that the block producers have this sort of hidden power to order the transactions in their own will. And basically, like as we all know and we've seen, data shows that they're constantly doing this. But not only that, it also comes in the application layer because it is important to realize that the different trading mechanisms that you use when interacting in Ethereum will expose you to less or more MEV. So be careful out there choosing your trading mechanism when you're executing your trades on Ethereum. Not only that, but it also comes from the fact that we're always going to live in a world that there's going to be a difference in prices between the reality that's happening off-chain and the reality that's happening on-chain. In other words, there's always going to be latency arbitrage, kind of like this competition to get the opportunity to buy cheap in either a Uniswap or whatever and kind of sell at a higher price in a centralized exchange. And lastly, what is truly like a little bit the nonsense in here is that even though the transactions are truly atomically, atomically happening in Ethereum, the prices are not. We often see that we have blocks that have multiple transactions and they're happening atomically at the same time. But if you kind of look carefully at the data, you can see that there's a, a price disparity with the same token pairs and even in the same token, uh, even in the same trading venue. This is a bit of a big issue in finance because it's very nonsense that the transactions are happening at the same time, but the prices are completely different. And now that we know the definition and we know where MEV comes from, let's see what you can do with the power of inserting transactions at your own will. So there are three main forms of attack in MEV that are well known. The first one is front running. And basically front running consists of any transaction that has any sort of value, such as like a liquidation on our arbitrage, will go from I get it to basically the block producer get it. And they do that because they have the power to insert the transaction wherever they want. But not only that, the irony is that if I send the transaction to kind of get the liquidation through the mempool, what the block producer will do will uh, replicate the transaction, put their transaction in front of mine, and even like the ironic thing is that my transaction will also be included after so that they can earn the, the gas fees that I've paid, and, and in the end, my transaction gets reverted. Then we have back running, that even though uh, it's kind of notorious that people argue that back running is less harmful in the ecosystem, one can argue that it's still back running is harmful because it's still taking away the opportunity from someone else. 
And basically, this is if you're like a large hedge fund and a whale or like, you know, a big trader, and you're, you're doing like a, let's say, a million dollar trade against a single AMM, you're going to like leave the, the reserve pool, the reserve prices of that AMM on balance in comparison to the other AMMs. Of course, you know you're going to do that because you know what you're doing. And that means that your first trade is going to create kind of like an arbitrage opportunity to rebalance the other pools. And you can try to sequence the trades in a way that you are the ones that snatch that opportunity. But because you don't have the power to kind of sequence the trades in the order that you want, mainly as soon as your transactions hit the mempool, someone else is going to take that opportunity from you. And lastly, the most famous one, the sandwich attack, and the one that is most hurtful to the users. And the sandwich attacks happen because in reality, you think that you're placing a market order when you're trading on an AMM or, a, or an aggregator. But essentially, what you're doing is the, uh, setting a limit order that is controlled by your slippage tolerance. And this is how the, minor, how the block producers now take advantage from you, because what they do is basically insert a transaction in front of yours that pushes the price up to your maximal slippage, slippage tolerance pain point, then insert your transaction so it pushes the price even, even higher to later on execute another transaction in the opposite direction. And what this uh, finalizes is that the miner has, make, has been able to make profit at your cost by basically buying low and selling high at the expense of you getting a very bad price. But how damaging is MEV? Well, according to Egan5 website, which is a website that specializes in DeFi and MEV analytics, throughout the last month of September, in the last 30 days, 90% of the top 10 explorer contracts are either AMM or aggregators. Not only that, but 10 out of the 13 billions that MEV volume has moved in September have been, per, have been used to perform sandwich attacks. And as we just saw, this is the most hurtful attack for the users because it gives them the, the worst price. And, and lastly, um, chain sign analytics using the data from the Flashbox team has estimated that since 2020, there's been a total of $1.3 billion of MEV extraction from the users. Now, why are, why are these numbers a problem? These numbers are a problem because if Ethereum truly wants to become the world, com the world computer due to its ability to settle transactions in a decentralized, open, and, and atomic manner, we need to try to fix MEV. And we need to try to, to fix MEV because I think we all want to and believe that Ethereum will indeed become the world computer and absorb the, all the transaction value of the world. And then if that happens, the logical thing to say is that at the current stage of things, also MEV is going to increase. And if MEV increase, this is going to poke the regulators. And basically, the regulators are going to come in and kind of try to, try to dictate how we should operate the market. We've already seen that in several reports from the Bank of International Settlements, how they try to establish like whether um, a front running or sandwiching is illegal activity, or even more particularly in, in Europe, where I'm from. Uh, we can already see this in the Mika regulation that current, like the current forms of front running or sandwich attacks will be deemed uh, illegal under the ESMA market structures. This, of course, is a problem because I think we all, believe, we, we all don't want to have the regulators to come in and dictate how the market should run, but rather we want to just build technical solutions that like, address this problem so that the regulator doesn't have to step in and kind of like ruin the party. So. What is CAP protocol? CAP protocol is the trading mechanism that underpins, hopefully now, the famous UI, CAP of exchange. And it's similar to an AMM or an aggregator, but with the fundamental small difference that we add a thin batching layer on top of them that allows us to execute, um, that are, sorry, that allows us to aggregate multiple trades together and execute them, execute them in a single Ethereum transaction. Not only batching allows us to do this sort of aggregation for transactions, but it also allows us to give a structurally better prices via cows, which stands for coincidence of ones. And this gives better prices because if the, same, the counter opposite orders are in the same batch, we can match the user peer to peer, and therefore they don't need to go to the liquidity pool and thus save on transaction and transaction costs, on liquidity provider fees, and on price impacts. Batching also allows us to be the sort of metadex aggregator, similar to, scanner, to Sky Scanner. We can query all the AMMs or all the liquidity on chain, as well as the, all the other aggregators, so that in a sense, your kind of baseline price is always going to be the price that the AMM or the aggregator gives you, 
but because batching offers certain benefits, we, all, like, we almost always improve it. Then it also offers MEV protection because the, one of the key reasons for batching is that the batch executors have to guarantee the price that you get. So either you get your price or your, your trade is not going to go through and thus you're not going to be faced with failed transactions. And lastly, for all the if maxis that we're all here, it also allows you to do gasless swaps, which basically allows you to uh, pay the gas fees in your sell token. And you don't need to ETH actually for trading on, on CowSwap. So how do we actually reduce the MEV on chain through batch auctions? Well, the goal is that through batch auctions, we want to reduce the overall interactions with AMMs. And if we have to go to AMMs, then at least we're going to try to diminish the level of exposures that, uh, that uh, the trades are going to have against MEV by applying certain rules to the batch auctions. The main way to actually reduce MEVs, as we just saw, is executing coincidence of ones. And because you don't need to trade against a liquidity pool and the trades are matched completely peer to peer, therefore there is no matter in the order of those transactions because it's a pure simple transfer between two parties and, and there is nothing like no one can get in the middle. Then second, the, if we have to go to the AMMs, then we try to break order dependency by having a single price per asset per batch. And basically, this is achieved because every single batch settlement through, uh, that happens in Cow Protocol has uniform clearing prices. And uniform clearing prices, that means that like, the people that are trading the same token pairs in the same parts are always going to get the same price, unlike what is happening right now, that we see a lot of price disparity. And this is guaranteed because the executors of the, batch, of the batch commit to a price vector that, regardless of the order of the trades, are always going to give the same outcome. In other words, no, the order of the factor does not, does not alter the product. And lastly, batch auctions allows us to like, re-aggregate fragmented liquidity via ring trades. This is something very interesting because it allows us to actually kind of match different users without the need to go through many, like, without the need to go through many liquidity pools. And for example, here we have a batch where we have four different users and where we have kind of like a coincidence of one and a ring trade where the four different users are, tra are trading four different tokens and they're all, they're all trading in the same batch and without having to touch an AMM because each user is kind of providing the liquidity needed for the other user kind of like in the, in the circle. So in the first one, it would be like in the, in the, oh, sorry. In the, in the top, no, we have DAI against Aura, and the, the actually the liquidity for the first one that's selling DAI goes to the other one that's trying to buy USDT, and so on. And like we make a circle, no, USDC, USDT, and USDC against Aura. Now, how do we actually compete for MEV, man, MEV minimization? Cow Protocol outsources the settlement of these batch auctions to a competition of third-party algorithms. Whoever gives the, whoever, whatever algorithm gives the best price improvement for the, for the user and thus the minimizes MEV the most is the one that actually wins the right to settle the, to settle the batch auction. Uh, not only they win the right to settle the batch auction, but it also gets rewarded for doing so. Currently, right now, there are 12 different solvers competing against each other for kind of like minimizing the amount of MEV or in other words, maximizing the value for the users and they can be grouped into four different types of solvers. We will have single order solvers that basically specialize on just settling uh, one order in a batch. Then we will have batch count dex aggregator solvers that specialize on finding this coincidence of ones amongst users. Then we will have mixed integer programming solvers which kind of are able to settle multiple trades against uh, like Uniswap B2 or Uniswap B3 style kind of pool. And lastly, we will have the quasi-linear solver uh, or quasi-modo that specialize in settling uh, trades of the batch auctions in more fancy pools like Balancer. So what are the differences between the maximization and minimization mindsets? Is really MEV protection, is all the MEV protection out there the same thing? Well, of course not. Although one can argue that, in my opinion, no, Flashbox technology and Cow Protocol technology are kind of two sides of the same coin. They're two sides of the same coin because both technologies outsource the settling of the transaction to a competition of third parties. And in that competition, the kind of the winner is the one that optimizes the bundle of transactions in the best possible way for the users. 
The difference here is like who is the monarch in both systems. In the case of Flashbots, no, they're trying to maximize the value for the validators and thus kind of like maximizing the extraction for the users. But in the case of Cow Protocol, we're trying to maximize the value for the users and thus minimize the value for the validators. So what are Flashbot goals and, and mission? Well, Flashbots is a collective group of individuals that have done a lot of work in kind of like highlighting the issues of MEV in the space and kind of educate a lot of people and, and make us realize what are the consequences of building systems that are prone to MEV. But from their website, you can take that their goals is divided into three steps. The first one is to illuminate the dark forest and they've done so via MEV expect or MEV explore. And basically, this helped educate a lot of people within the Ethereum community by putting a number and seeing how hurtful MEV is. The second one is democratize extraction. Before MEV get or MEV boost, uh, the extraction was only available to a very few amount set of players. But now, with the democratization of their tool, a lot more people can do it. And while it's good that a lot more people can actually like, you know, do extraction, we need to try to realize that we're kind of democratizing a weapon that is harming the overall like Ethereum users. So it's kind of like a tricky situation here. And then lastly, distributing the benefits. This is still a not very clear part or very clear how they're going to achieve it. But right now, one can say that like they're redistributing the benefits to the wrong people because the benefits right now that are coming from MEV extraction are going to the validators, which are not the ones that are creating the opportunities, because in the end, the opportunities are created by the traders. Are created by the traders, yeah. So what are Cow Protocol's goals and missions? Well, Cow Protocol goal is to actually achieve one single price per token per batch, and we want to try to achieve that by basically executing one batch settlement per every block. But if we are to compare as well into three main points, we will have that the first one is protection from the dark forest, and basically, we do this by executing the coincidence of ones where the user doesn't have to go against the liquidity pool. And also, through a delegating trading model execution, where the user doesn't send the transaction directly to the mempool, but rather sends it to an offset, an off-chain set of relayers that will be the ones that kind of like handle how they, the transaction hits the mempool. Then the second one is, if we have to go to the AMMs and if we have to go to the mempool, we try to avoid extraction by enforcing certain rules to dispatch auctions. And the most, the most important rule is the uniform clearing prices, which in the end breaks the order dependency and thus makes those trades much more or less MEVable. And lastly, distribute the benefits. If you're trading on CapSwap already today, you already know this. If not, I recommend you doing so. But to already today, it's kind of like the price improvements that these so-called solvers or searchers are able to find are given to the users instead of being kept for them. And for example, in this case, we can see the kind of like the patch in the middle that uh, there was like 18 different trades and on average, there was a surplus of 2.5% for each order. But to sum it up, how are they different? No? In the case of Cow Protocol technology, if we look at the key metric that evaluates the success of the technology is the overall reduction or overall reduction of the exposure of MEV versus in the case of Flashbox technology, the key metric is how much MEV is being extracted. Looking at the word democratization, no? one can argue that the Cow Protocol technology is democratizing the tools for protecting users versus Flashbox technology that they're democratizing the tools for extracting value from the users or from attacking the users or hurting the users. And if we are to look at how these two different technologies interact with a uh, on chain, the goal of Cow Protocol technology is kind of reduce the, level, the amount of AMM interactions that the users have, because in the end, like AMMs are the reason that uh, MEV exists. But in the case of in the case of Flashbots, they want to maximize the amount of AMM interactions because these ways they can maximize the slippage tolerance from your trades and kind of extract the most value from you. And lastly, if we look at how both systems kind of like play by the rules. In the case of Cow Protocol, we see that the, the more money to the users, the less MEV and the higher the chances of have for winning and the right to settle the batch. And in the case of, of Flashbots, the more money that goes to the validators, the less money that goes to the user. And therefore, the more MEV, the higher the chances uh, you have of winning. So where are we heading? As I said before, not all is lost. Like we believe in building technical solutions that can kind of address this type of problems. And we think we're on the right path to kind of like reduce all the 
big chunk of MEV that is happening right now on, on Ethereum. So what is the future of, of DEXs? We believe that the future of DEXs is one that focuses on fairness and cost improvement for, Im for the users, rather than just let them trade in kind of like suboptimal ways. It is one also that offers MEV protections, because as we said before, if the transaction value in Ethereum is going to increase, MEV protection is going to become more and more important. It also, it's also one that puts the users at the center of it. No? In the end, in our system, the users are the monarchs because they are the ones that are creating the opportunities for different price improvements. So they, they are the ones that should actually be rewarded for it and not other parties in the system. And lastly, it's one that abstracts users from complicated technology. It is unrealistic to expect that everyone is going to know what is an RPC or how to add an RPC or even stay up to date on all the different liquidity pools to trade your token or what is the like, hottest new DeFi like trading venue. And how are we going to get there? No? What does the future of finance look like? Well, the future of finance looks like the, uh, one that we have a cow batch builder where this builder commits to have the first transaction of the block to be a cow protocol settlement. And this is important because if the first transaction of the block is a cow protocol settlement, then we're going to have uniform trading prices in all the trades that are happening within there. And therefore, there is no MEV that can happen with the trades. Then if that's the case and we have that first transaction, then the transactions that are going to come after are going to actually be like true intents of arbitrage from the market. And we're going to be able to like have uh, the overall Ethereum ecosystem, in a sense, focus on the real market efficiency. Because right now, it, a lot of the arbitrage that's happening is toxic arbitrage, and it's not arbitrage from the market, but rather the leftovers that the MEV attackers are kind of leaving, leaving in there. And lastly, it would be like the combination of the utopian side of the Flashbox technology with Cow Protocol. So how does it, this look like? Well, currently, we have this, this scenario right now in Ethereum where we have the mempool and we have the different searches or private order flow that submit their bundles to the builder, and then it goes to the relay and, and the validator. But for us, the key is to kind of break the, the order and kind of transform searches into cow builder and put cow protocol and cow shop in the middle of it in a way that if we, make, if we convince builders to focus on the utopian side and kind of shift their revenue mindset from hurting users to actually protecting no, and maximizing to the value of the users, then we're going to have a, a much overall better outcome in, within Ethereum. And will the market fix MEV? Well, the question is that if MEV maximization takes over, we will have not built the future of finance, but rather have just built the new old system, but just with new rails. So help us build the future of finance, because we're hiring for a lot of positions. And thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Hello. Uh, Alex. Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, question. So the batch auction process you're describing uh, is one in which you have a bunch of orders from, from individual traders, and then a collection of solvers each submit a price vector that can satisfy all of those orders. How do you get the individual traders to commit to an order without them knowing the final price? Well, basically, it's like they see in, a, like, in the way it works is that when you go to CloudSwap, you sign a message with your intent to trade. And basically, the, your, your baseline price is the quarter price that we give you. So from there, the solvers start working on trying to improve the price. So you're always at least at base, you're going to get what we have showed you in the UI. And from there, if there, are, uh, if there are price improvements that the solvers can find, be a coincidence of one or some sort of batching, then it's going to be rewarded in the form of surplus from you. So you're going to get more. How is the course price calculated? By basically looking at the on-chain uh, on prices, and from there, like we, we, we discount the gas. Okay, uh, here. Sorry. Thank you for the talk. Um, uh, the question is, do you have any guarantee that the individual user is going to have its trade executed in a batch? Mm, like the way it works is that you sign a message, no? And then if, if, if your prices get out of market, then the, 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 the trade is not going to execute, but you're not going to get, a, uh, you're not gonna get charged for a failed transaction or anything because simply the trade doesn't execute. So in a sense, like the guarantee is that if, you're, if, you're tr if your order is more or less within the market pricing, 
then within a matter of 30 seconds to one, mi one minute is of course going to be included. Hi, um, I'm here. Sorry. Hi, thanks for your thought. I was just wondering, you compare flash pulse and cow swap, but isn't cow swap solving for like a subset of the MEV that flash pulse is trying to solve for? And also, how do you feel about MEV maximization with MEV rebates being equal to MEV minimization? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah. Um, so you compare flash pulse and cow swap, but um, how do you feel about? Uh, I, to me, it seems like cow swap is solving for a subset of the MEV that flash pulse is trying to solve for. As in, you, for example, you don't solve for illiquid pairs, and you only solve for MEV that goes through AMMs. But Flashbox is not trying to solve for MEV. Flashbox is just making a tool that is making MEV extraction more accessibly uh, common for the for whatever user. But in the end, the goal of their action is that the higher, the more MEV, the more I'm going to pay, and the more likely I'm going to be included. Like my bundle is more likely going to be included on the on the next transaction, and they do that because they're in, in the execution layer. And the problem is that they are able to do that because the trading mechanisms that people use, like AMMs, expose their users to MEV. But what we try to do is kind of like fix the MEV at the application layer so that then Flashbox wouldn't have like a way to extract MEV. So if like, you know, in the end, if, if the solvers kind of like find the optimal prices and uniform clearing prices, the MEV that will go to the block producers is non-existent because there's no, like it doesn't matter the order of the transactions. I don't know if I convince you. <laughs> Thank you.